А, коллеги, нас стало больше, чем в прошлом году, сильно больше. Это очень приятно. Я напомню, что в моей картине мира, и организаторы разделяют мое мнение, конференция — это место в первую очередь, чтобы пообщаться. Потому что, конечно, в интернете и в книжках есть все. Но тут есть один нюанс, маленькое когнитивное искажение. А в интернет обычно пишут только те, кто хочет писать, и то, что они хотят написать. Мы видим такой либо вау-срез, как все получается, либо такой ранд, что вот, ну, все пофейлилось. Конференция в этом плане уникальное место, где вы можете послушать спикера, который расскажет свое мнение на какую-то тему, а затем поймать его во время пофи-брейка и узнать, что же на самом деле происходит в индустрии. В этом основная ценность конференции. Мы пригласили спикеров с очень интересными темами. Мы пригласили спикеров из-за рубежа. Они приехали и прилетели сюда специально, чтобы с вами общаться. Они ни в коем случае не будут от вас прятаться, как это обычно происходит на конференциях. Все мы будем тусоваться в этом большом лобби и пить кофе литрами. И поэтому вы со своей стороны Стороны, тоже не стесняйтесь, общайтесь, задавайте вопросы, чтобы узнать, что же на самом деле происходит в IT. В первом потоке будет много англоязычных спикеров. Они спокойно готовы общаться с нами даже на не очень хорошем английском. И если у кого-то будут вопросы с английским языком, вы всегда можете ловить меня. Я вам обеспечу перевод в реальном времени. После выступления спикеров моя коллега, вот она сидит, будет передавать вам микрофон, чтобы вопросы остались в записи. И, конечно, если вы хотите задать вопрос, но не уверены в английской формулировке, задавайте вопрос по-русски, я переведу его на английский. Окей, uh, okay. uh, I don't want to uh, wait. Uh, so, uh, one second, uh, please. Uh, many of you know Alejandro uh, Sauceda and his uh, colleagues. Uh, Alejandro worked at Bloomberg. Uh, after that, he is famous with Hacktrain, uh, Hackathon, and uh, now he is in a private uh, consulting uh, business. And of course, he will highlight a topic that's extremely hot, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So please, welcome uh, on the stage Donald White and Alejandra Saucedo. Applause, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Dobre utra. Guys, very excited to be here today. Myself, Donald White, uh, in the beautiful Moscow to give you a talk on deep learning with uh, RNNs in Python, recurrent neural networks. A brief about myself. I am the founder at Exponential Technologies, and I'm the head of deployed engineering at a machine learning NLP startup in London called Eigen Technologies. I'm going to give uh, Donald a bit of uh, time for introducing as well. Uh, does this mic? There we go. Uh, so I'm a uh, machine learning engineer at uh, a hedge fund. So um, I've been working in software engineering for about seven years now. Uh, have worked for various government agencies, uh, large companies, and now I primarily work on building machine learning pipelines that allow um, traders to, um, yeah, to essentially uh, make smart investments. Awesome. And today we're going to be very excited to go through an interesting talk creating an AI author. We're going to take uh, a tons of novels, 34,000 English novels, to train a deep neural network on writing novels. Uh, this is going to be trained from scratch, and the output would look something like this. This is basically generated by a machine. It says, gradually drawing away from the rest, two combatants are striving, each other devoting every nerve. So you can see how it has learned from no input whatsoever besides the label uh, from, from, the, from the input itself. Uh, this is written with less than 100 lines of TensorFlow code. And we are going to be using the open source Gutenberg dataset that contains all of these novels. 
We're going to take all of the input, merge it into one single document, split it into uh, 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 the characters themselves represented as integers, and then uh, I introduce this into the neural network so that it learns itself. And we're going to walk through how this process uh, works from a theoretical perspective as well as from an applied Python perspective. We have a lot of content, so please bear with us. And come to our workshop because that is where we are going to get our hands dirty to really actually walk step by step on how we built this model. By the end of the workshop, you'll have something that you'll be able to take and use on your spare time. So to start with, we're going to start with some theoretical perspective on traditional machine learning, not yet on neural networks. So machine learning, it's all about taking some input and trying to predict the output. Create a model that takes an input and knows what the output is. This is quite ambiguous to any function that is represented in a feature space. The feature space can be anything, such as the area, the perimeter, uh, the character uh, uh, size, the, uh, the shape. And this uh, uh, feature space represents where the input is located. Into, into this multi-dimensional space. And it could be uh, high dimension over like, like hundreds of dimensions sometimes. This allows us to be able to see the shapes and the inputs in this feature space, uh, which allows us to, to use for formulas like linear functions in this case, as you might see familiar, the f uh, function of x equals mx plus c, which you must be quite familiar with the linear function allows us to create, in this case, a line that divides the data, in this case, squares and triangles. And you can see how they divide based on their area and their perimeter. So our feature space represents how the functions are in this. And we want to create a trained model that is able to understand how, with an input, it tells you what it is. In this case, is it a square or is it a triangle? Very simplistic terms. An example is just using a bunch of different sized uh, 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 triangles and, and squares. You can see how they, they diverge. And we can very easily train a, a linear model, a, a line that divides it. And when we give it a new input, it tells you that it's, in this case, a, a triangle itself. So very, very simple. Now the hard part is how do we learn what we call the hyperparameters of the function itself, m and c. That is what machine learning is about, learning this, this, uh, this, this uh, weights themselves. So once we know how to do it, can this be used to actually learn novels and learn language? Uh, but unfortunately, we need something much more complex and flexible. In this case, we have a sentence that says, Valentin's favorite drink is beer. He likes laggers the most. You can see that you require context and enti entity recognition that cannot just be achieved with a, with a linear function. That is how we come into deep neural networks, a much more flexible model that is still inspired from a simple linear model that, that we just revised. Deep neural networks allow us to extract complex p patterns. We still have the sim same taking an input and pr uh, try to predict the output by modifying the weights in the function, but it's a much more complex function that we can use. We still use the raw data as an input, uh, and in this case, it's the training data of the existing novels, and we don't need any manual feature extraction. We just feed this in, and we use the data itself to train it. The, the, the first thing to introduce um, neural networks is the mighty perception, which is equivalent to this linear model. In this case, instead of having f of x equals mx plus c, we represent it with the usual machine learning terminology, y equals function of f, weights, times inputs, plus bias. And this is what you're going to see throughout. Uh, the weights are the, 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 the parameters that we want to learn together with the bias. x is the input, in this case, the characters in the novels. And f is a function that we use to transform what each of the output is. This is exactly equivalent to how you see it, and this is how the perception looks. You have the inputs coming into the neuron. The neuron has um, a multiplication of the weights, uh, the sum plus the bias, and then the, 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 the function, uh, activation function, that gives you the output. Very, very simple. But the question is, 
you know, what is this activation function and why do you need it, it is ambiguous to firing the, the neuron itself. Hence why neural networks simulate uh, 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 and are um, uh, 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 synonymous to the brain itself because they fire uh, signals themselves. In this case, we use a sigmoid function, which squashes between a zero or a one. So how do we learn WMB in such a complex model? In this case, we use a perception learning algorithm, which learns the bias and the weights. You take a black box, give it an input, get an output, and tell if, if it's right or wrong. And then it modifies the weights inside, and then tries again. In this case, we can use you know, cats and dogs, in some feature space that is multidimensional, we can find a function that is able to separate these two. In this case, we only have two inputs. So we have a very simple data that goes like, with these two inputs, I can put a line here. But then we have another input, and then we modify how our function divides the data, and another one, and then another cat. So now if you give it a new cat, it would basically just know based on where it is uh, located, whether it's a cat or a dog. Now, representing text, how do we do that and how do we feed that into a neural network? We can represent it as a single word or as the single individual characters. In this case, we will use the characters as the input to our neural network. Here we have uh, the characters represented as numbers. They feed into the neural network. They get multiplied by the weights. They get summed by the bias. Uh, they go through the activation function and we get an output. This is as simple as getting an input of letter B it might give you a predicted character, which is A. And then based on that, it would modify the weights themselves to try to find it. And we would be predicting kind of like a specific um, sentence itself. So we have something so far, which is one step closer to the neural networks. However, we have a problem. As single perceptions are straight single line equations. So they're very, very, very simple. You can represent very complex uh, data sets. So how, do we, how are we able to represent something more complex than just uh, a triangle and a, and, a, and a square? That is when we introduce multiple perceptions in one single layer. That allows us to represent pretty much much, um, much more bigger amounts of uh, data sets and feature spaces. However, we also introduce depth because that allows us to have more flexibility on the learning itself. You know, this allows us to take complex data like languages. That gives us one more step closer towards it. Now, in terms of neuron connectivity, all the layers are interconnected. All of the inputs go to all the layers. And same for all of the further nodes in the hidden layers. This allows us to create and, and abstract this into a matrix function of weights. These are pretty much the same weights as in the linear function, but just in, in, a, in, a, in a matrix form that you're able to use to actually learn and compute. This is what we want to learn. We give it the inputs, they get multiplied, they go to the function, and it gives you an output. And this is a black box that the neural network pretty much learns. So now let's get to training the neural networks. For that, given that we give an input and we predict the output, we need to somehow tell this black box that it's right or wrong. Because if it's right, it just continues. If it's wrong, it modifies its internal models um, in this case, we use an optimization uh, loss function for this that tells basically whether it's correct or incorrect. You know, lower loss values equals better performance, better performance equals better prediction. Ultimately, this is synonymous to a gradient descent optimizer. The only difference is that instead of a linear, uh, simple linear model, it's a highly multidimensional uh, with many, many variables. And for this, for this gradient descent problem, we use this thing called back propagation, which is equivalent to gradient descent. It's pretty much just gradient descent on steroids. Bit more complex, but, but it's pretty much the same concept. This consists of a forward pass and a backward pass. And this is pretty much, you take an input, it goes in, and you compare it with what it's supposed to be. And based on that, you get an error, and you tell the model to modify itself based on that error. So, it goes back in the, in the backward pass, modifying the, the weights themselves. And that's how you train a neural network model uh, as you give it more data. After training the network, you obtain the, the weights, which minimize the prediction errors. And then you put, and in, the, in our example, now coming back to these novels, we want to predict the next character that is coming. So 
if we want to give it these novels, it will always try to predict what is the next character. If it gets it right, it's fine. If it gets it wrong, then that's when you modify the weights. So you can imagine how complex this is to actually test it. But we're getting closer to our output. However, this sentence itself still has no, con it's not context aware. It's not semantics aware. It doesn't have idea about the past. It just takes one character, gives you something else. It doesn't understand that before it had something that affected what, what the next thing was. So in language, this is very important because you're going to have things that affect what is coming later. That's when deep recurrent networks come in. And this is for time aware or sequence aware data that requires awareness of the previous inputs, such as language, such as uh, stocks in the, in the financial market. Uh, anything that is time aware would, would be uh, relevant for this. Now let's, let's, let's bear with me. Let's, let's take it back to what we had. We had a single perception. Um, we had the neural network with multiple uh, outputs, so multiple perceptions. And then we had the deep neural networks with multiple perceptions and multiple layers. In order to go forward with this, we're going to simplify this context, and we're going to squash them all into this representation. So this basically just represents that. So for, for, for this example, just bear with me, we're going to represent that deep neural network with this. The difference between normal neural networks and recurrent networks is that the output of each of the neurons gets fed into the next iteration. In this case, we're calling it O0, O1, O2. Uh, that is the key difference to start with. That is the key difference that you get the output and then you fit it into the next one. So the character that you had in the past, the output of that neuron gets fed into the next one. So now you can see how it's actually context aware. You can see it like this. This is the same neural network, this is the same neural network but the difference is that it's fed to the, next, uh, to the next iteration, where that is the time series. So this is not multiple different layers. So, so this is not multiple different networks. It's the same network, but the output of the first run goes into the output of the second one. And it still passes the same way. Um, in this case, for example, the character B, you know, outputs, tries to predict the next character, which is O. That is correct. The next character is O. It tries to predict B. So it's trying to say Bob. And it's just trying to predict what is the next character. If it gets it right, that's fine. If it gets it wrong, it modifies the weights. And in this case, it continues, continues going, and it keeps feeding into the next round. So the problem is that still, we know what came before, but we still don't know what came a while back. You know, and this is where um, long-term dependencies really affect because language, not only you care about the, the character that came before, but you care about the context of many characters that came before. And you want to be aware of that. So that's when you actually are able to cre create a cell state. You know, and this is what makes recurrent neural networks possible. The fact that you can store a state and make the neural network context aware. And this is besides just passing the output, you also pass the state. And the state gets slightly modified. You know, there's a simplified version, but you, you get the gist. And in this case, this is what you end up with. You end up with a neural network that passes the context and passes the output of the previous one. And this, the hidden layer and the cell state is fed into the next iteration of the step. So now we basically have a neural network that is context aware and that is able to actually uh, understand what happened before. And I'm going to pass it to Donald so he talks about how we're going to be training the recurrent networks. Thank you, Alejandro. OK, so uh, you train recurrent neural networks in pretty much the same way as regular neural networks, which means that we use gradient descent and backpropagation, exactly what Alejandro discussed before. As a recap, when we train a network, we're essentially feeding in the input, which is our current character, to the end where the output is the predicted next character, and we're comparing that with how close it was to the actual next character. And then based on that, we propagate errors back and adjust the weights. So we need data for this, and as we mentioned, we're using 34,000 English novels where we just have a whole sequence of characters and we keep trying to predict the next one. There are many ways you can run back propagation. So you can, the, the main way you do it with recurrent neural networks is you take your entire set of data, your entire flat sequence of 34,000 novels, and then you split them into small sequences, where each sequence represents some, a single run of a recurrent neural network. So for example, if you have that loop unrolling that Alejandro showed before, then um, you, if you had a sequence of 30 characters, you would have 30 unrolls of that loop. So 
Um, you can either run back propagation after a single sequence, so after every single short sequence, like a sentence, for example, you adjust the weights, or you can run it after running all the sequences, which is billions of characters, potentially, or you can do it in small batches, so you have several sequences and many batches. Um, pretty much the, the industry standard is to use mini-batch, and this is because if you try and use batch, where you process all sequences at once, then that's incredibly memory inefficient. Imagine you're someone like Google, and you're actually training a network on probably trillions of characters. Then you need to store in memory the results of all of those characters before you compute the, uh, the error, and then back-propagate and adjust the weights. So, um, and stochastic, which is one sequence at a time, just takes too long to converge and find good weights that produce good accuracy. So, yeah, we essentially take our sequence of characters, we split them into batches, and after each batch, we run back propagation and adjust the weights. So, now we're actually going to dive into some code. Um, this is going to be very high level. In the workshop, we're actually going to be live coding and building this entirely from scratch. Um, so, bear with me as I kind of run through this quite quickly. Um, but essentially, building a neural network requires two things. Defining its architecture, which is where the nodes fit, how many layers you have, is it recurrent, is it not, for example, uh, and then learning the weight matrices by deciding what learning algorithm you want to use, like gradient descent. However, these learning algorithms are very complicated. This is a tiny snapshot of uh, a tiny segment of the uh, computation graph to learn the weights of a, si of a simple recurrent neural network. And there's a lot of maths involved. So we don't want to actually hand roll and hand write all of this. So we're going to use TensorFlow for this. TensorFlow, I'm sure you've all heard of it before, is a very high level library for building computation, computational graphs that among many things can actually be used to learn the weights of a network. There are other tools as well. We picked TensorFlow for two reasons, which were um, primarily it's got loads of documentation and the second thing is it's got very good recurrent neural network support. It's literally three lines of code to build a recurrent network. So this is the model that we're going to try and build in TensorFlow. So it's based on all the concepts that Alejandro already discussed. We take our input character, we explode that into a one-hot vector, which is where we have, say, 90 possible character types, and you set um, one, of them, one of those nodes to one when that character is present and everything else to zero. We feed that through three hidden layers, where each hidden layer is going to have 512 uh, individual nodes in. And you see here that we have this green box, which is our cell state. So this is the long-term memory of the network. And as you can see, after every run of every layer, we feed the uh, cell state back in again. And this is how it remembers things that happened in the past. This is how it will predict that if, if, it's, if you have a sentence like, Valentin likes beer, then what comes next will be, he likes lagers the most, for example. Um, finally, the output is actually a probability distribution. So that is a probability of the next character so if you have 90 character types, you have 90 probabilities. So we simply pick the probability that is the highest, and then that becomes the predicted next character. So in TensorFlow, a computation graph has two main primitives. Tensors, which represent data, either vectors or matrices of numbers, um, and operations, which obviously operate on the data. You can kind of think of it like tensors are the edges, and operations are the nodes. So in this case, um, we have some input node. We feed in some input vector of two elements. Uh, become, that gets the tensor there. Hits an operation which multiplies the, those two elements, which then goes to the sum. And then the sum is the final output, which sums both elements together. So this graph, very basic as it is, um, is these lines of code. So this is basically how we define a TensorFlow model. We use tf.placeholder, which specifies the inputs. Um, in this case, a two-dimensional vector, hence the two there. We triple the numbers, so this is an operation. We have internal operations, outputs, reduce sum, and then to actually run the graph, we construct a tf.session object. We call session.run, passing in the node that we want to compute, which is our output node, and then we also pass in our inputs. So here we're actually inputting um, 310, and when you actually run the graph, that is the output, 930, because we're tripling them and then summing them together. So hyperparameters. So we're defining some general parameters of the model. Um, for starters, we're going to be using a sequence length of 30. This means that our recurrent neural network actually has 30 time steps, 30 characters. Um, 
we are going to use a batch size of 200. So each, we're going to run back propagation after every 200 times 30 characters. Um, and then our hidden layer size, i.e. the number of cells in each hidden layer is 512, and we have three hidden layers. You adjust these accordingly and see what works best when you're actually building these models in reality. So if we're defining the input, we just use tf.placeholder. Here, the key difference is we're not just passing in one character. Because we're, every single training step, every single run of the graph is a single step of backpropagation, you actually want to um, make this uh, all the characters in a single batch. So think of this input as a matrix where the rows are sequences of 30 characters. So there's 30 columns. The rows are 200 for the 200 sequences, and that is the input. We explode all of those into that one hot vector representation. This is so common in neural networks that there's already a TensorFlow function to do this, just tf.1hot. And then we feed this output into our hidden layer. So here, we have a, the hidden state, which is an input. The key thing here is that these yellow boxes at the bottom represent the fact that this, the hidden cell state is an input. Because after every run, the output cell state becomes the input of the next one. And then we, we create something called a GRU cell. Now, uh, there are many different implementations of cell states in neural networks. LSTM and GRU are the most popular. Uh, we don't have time to really go into much detail on that here. It's a very heavy theory involved. Um, for now, we're just going to hand wave and say that this is a type of neural network node um, which stores some hidden state that can provide long-term memory. And you see we create 512 of those, and then we do that three times for all the hidden layers. And we wrap that in this multi-RNN cell object. So now we need to unroll the graph. At the moment, we still just have loops. We've defined these, these recurrent cells, but we haven't actually defined any way to unroll the network 30 times for each character in our 30-character sequence. So that's simply this line, tf.nn dynamic rnn. Um, that will dynamically unroll and generate new graph operations for our sequence of 30. The key thing to note here is the outputs. So the outputs is this y value, which will eventually be transformed into that output probability distribution we mentioned before, and also the output cell state. So when you put a character inside the network, it adjusts all the cell states of all of the nodes in every single hidden layer, and then that then gets fed into the next uh, run. Finally, this is some code we won't go into detail here, which converts the raw output into a softmax probability distribution layer. So now this is a probability distribution of what the next character is. Um, we use this tf.argmax to squash the probability distribution into a single uh, what the next character is. So we just pick the um, uh, character with the highest probability. And our remaining tasks for backpropagation, we need to define our loss function, which means that we need to also pass in the expected output so we can compare what our predicted output and the expected output was, which is this. So we just do the same thing again. We pass in the expected next character exactly the same as we pass in the current character. We explode with a one-hot vector, and then that gets fed into this loss uh, output, which also the probability distribution gets um, fed into. So you can think of it as like saying that if the output said it was very likely that A was the next character, and the next character was A, the loss is going to be low. It's going to be a good, good property. Whereas if it said it's not very likely at all to be A, like 0.0001 probability, then the loss is going to be very, very high, and the network is going to be very poor. So it's a very soft measure. It's not just a binary right or wrong. It depends on what the probabilities were. So um, again, this is just defining the inputs, so the expected Ys. Same thing as before, we pass in the matrix of batches and then sequences, sequence characters. Um, and then we compute the loss with this thing called softmax cross entropy, which is used for lo loss functions in um, anything to do with classification. So now we have our loss, and that is a new output. And we literally wrap that in this line to create a training step which will run back propagation or gradient descent to, uh, to minimize the loss. So finally, just quickly running through how we actually run these training steps, is what we do is we take all our mini batches for our entire sequence of 34,000 novels. Um, we run them many, many times. So we go over all 34,000 novels many, many, many times. And every single time we do it, we call it an epoch. Um, we typically run many, many epochs because the more you feed your inputs in, the, fact, the better the weights will normally be, until eventually your loss won't get any lower and your accuracy won't get any better.
So we just create a Python generator which, where we pass in our data, which is the, all the characters in our 34,000 novels. Um, we loop through the number of epochs we want. We loop through the number of batches that we have based on our batch size, and then we just yield training data. Based on that, we create a session object, just like we showed before. Um, we create our generator, uh, which is here. And then we initialize our input state. So our input state is a input cell state, this is. We initialize that to zero. And then we just literally iterate through every single um, batch many, many times based on the generator that we've configured. We set our graph inputs, which is the batch input, the expected batch output, um, and our input state. And then we call session.run on the training step to perform the back propagation on Y, which is the next character that we predict, and H, which is the output state. And the H one is also important um, because we store that output state. So you see here we're, running th we're getting the output of three nodes, which means that we get a three tuple back where each element corresponds to one of the outputs of those nodes. So the output state that we get back from session.run gets set to the input state for the next run. And that is how we have encode these long-term dependencies. So the final results are if we try to use the network to generate new characters, and the way we do this is we just put in an input character, we get the probability distribution, we pick a character from that probability distribution randomly, um, and then we just keep doing that again and again and again. When we don't train the network at all, we get this. When we train it a little bit, it starts to kind of figure out what words are. It's still random gibberish. When we train it on all the data, we actually start to get something which kind of makes sense, although it's still a bit weird. So for example, here is the goal of my fervor. I shouldn't be the shash of no. Sky is bright and blue is running gog on. That makes not really any sense. Like shash and gog aren't words, and it doesn't really make any kind of conceptual sense. Um, but you can see it's starting to learn. Uh, the key point we want to take away on this is that if you architect your network right, you can keep running more and more epochs, and eventually you get to the output that we had at the beginning. So you will eventually get to high quality. So either what happens when you train a network is you find that you keep running epochs and it doesn't get any better, or it gets better and better and better. And that is part of the research, is finding the right architecture that will support your problem. There's further examples as well. Um, for example, there's this really interesting blog post, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Recurrent Neural Networks. This thing actually trained a neural network on Linux kernel code, and it could generate reasonably looking C. And also, they trained a network on LaTeX documents and scientific papers, and found it could actually generate reasonably looking mathematical proofs. Obviously, if you actually looked at them, they'd probably be a bit funny. Anyway, so the key takeaway here is that you can apply this to many time series problems, and it all depends on how you define the architecture of your network, and everything else is pretty simple, thanks to TensorFlow and other tools like it. So now I'm going to pass to Alejandro to conclude. Awesome. Cool stuff. So, I mean, this, this is uh, success in a very simple uh, example, relatively simple example. However, you can see the power of using these recurrent neural networks in many other things. I mean, other examples that, that we've seen also that we've linked, uh, people that have ran it in actually in, in Python code, in the Python, uh, I think, like, like library, and it just uh, created gibberish that actually looks like code. It's probably better than, than, than my code, probably not. But uh, it's, it's cool to see how you can actually teach a neural network without even having to label data. Having said that, data is ultimately, and I cannot emphasize, the hardest, hardest thing to actually like, be able to nail. Uh, to recap, you know, we managed to do this in less than 100 lines of TensorFlow code. However, we're going to go um, uh, into more detail later. You can find the code in, in this link. I'm sure that uh, Valentin is going to share the slides later on. Um, but do make sure, you know, come to our workshop. Right now, we had to uh, leave a lot into the magic of the slides and, and request a lot of your trust that this works. But if you come to the workshop, you will be able to like run it yourself, and you'll be able to walk out with a deep understanding on how to implement your own models. So that's going to happen at 3 PM. Again, you know, please do make sure you reach out. Uh, you know, we're more than happy to connect. That's one of the main reasons uh, that we're here as well, to meet like-minded people. Uh, add us on, on Twitter, LinkedIn, GitHub, whatever you want, uh, VK. Uh, and with that say, uh, thank you very much. Well, show is passiva, guys. Uh, we look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Hi, thanks a lot for your talk. Um, I'm wondering, you, t you, uh, you said that um, 
like it's it's working. You can see uh, uh, we can see that it's working, right? And I wonder what's the limitations uh, at the moment. Uh, what do you think about the limitations of the approach of the methods like that? Um, Okay, I can answer this one. Uh, so um, the big limitation at the moment is still that the long-term memory is still not long-term enough. So for example, if you're writing a few paragraphs, it will, it will write things that make sense. Like it will actually all be in context. It will refer to characters or people or places that are all relevant in that context. But if you go on a much larger, um, size of discourse, so if you're going for like 100 pages, or even like 10 pages, then near the end of those 10 pages, it will start to forget what it was actually talking about or, or generating before. So you'll find it's almost like you won't be able to write like a 100 page or a 300 page novel in this. Um, the issue is still that the, the long term dependencies are still relatively short. So after 10 pages, it will just start drifting off into another topic or another story. Uh, may I continue? And um, you're saying that that's not the technical, uh, that's a technical problem or not? Is it not like I can add some other neurons with like long term memory that will be long enough to, you know, uh, run across like a, a long time? Um, like so steps? The, the issue is, is that it's not a matter of how many neurons you often throw at it. So the biggest problem with, and the reason why deep networks haven't really become big in the industry until the past like five years, is because of a problem called vanishing gradients. So when we were talking about backpropagation before, um, we backpropagate the errors. Um, but what happens is that's based on gradient descent, so it's based on the gradient of the loss. What happens is as you backpropagate back, the gradients start to get smaller and smaller and smaller, which means on the earlier nodes, um, the weights aren't being adjusted or changed at all. So there's a difference between a network having representability. Because in theory, even the most simple neural network can represent any function and any, any, any sort of data set. But learning the weights is the hard part because techniques like gradient descent and backpropagation have this vanishing gradient problem. And those long-term dependencies um, that were issues originally was because of vanishing gradients LSTMs and GRU cells, which are the cell states that we added to increase the dependencies, still have the problem, but they're just dramatically reduced, but they're still there. So there isn't really yet, um, this is an active research problem, like there's probably, there's hundreds if not thousands of PhD students right now trying to actually figure out these problems, but there isn't really a um, like one size fits all technique for having perfect memory and being able to retain it like forever. Yeah, I, th I think to add to that, I think, uh, you know, this, this talk, we actually focused on, on deep learning. But, you know, if I have to emphasize, uh, in, in industry, you know, as Donald mentioned, most of the times you will find uh, machine learning implementations that are much, much simpler and uh, implementations that take into account much more, uh, much man many more features uh, in the feature space itself. So instead of just feeding it characters, you would want to feed it a specific word with, its, uh, with a window of its uh, words on the sides, as well as some, 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 some context about it. And you would use probably other, other, other models themselves besides just deep neural networks. You know, I think, I think it depends really a lot on the problem you're trying to tackle. Спасите спикеров, потому что если вы не будете задавать вопросы, я начну задавать вопросы. Прошу. Буквально несколько секунд. Рит подбежит с микрофоном. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, simple question. What about how many CPU time needs to get this result? For example, uh, you talk about 50 epochs. And uh, what is about time? Depends how much, much money you can throw at it, right? Yeah, that's true. Sorry, so you're <laughs> asking about the time it took to train it? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, um, so that was actually run on my really crappy laptop, and it took a very long time. So I actually had the code to get this running finished about two weeks ago, uh, and that output took about a week and a half. Um, like, 
if one thing we in intend to set up is for our workshop is something is a Amazon GPU instance. So in production, what you're really going to do is you'll set up a bunch of Amazon GPU instances and you'll run it there to make it a lot faster. But basically, it's what Alejandro said. It really just depends on how much money you want to throw at it. Um, the biggest limitation, hence why you asked, you're totally right, is the fact that training time can take a very long time. So yeah, this was a week and a half, very long time on my crappy laptop. GPU instance, it probably would, my laptop doesn't even have a GPU, so my, uh, a GPU instance would probably take a day. Uh, if you Google, an hour or less, like 10, 20 minutes. Коллеги, еще вопросы? Thank you very much. A uh, very interesting talk. Uh, and uh, I have uh, an implied question. Uh, if we apply this technique to designing a keyboard, uh, do you think uh, we should st uh, still allow the network to learn from uh, each user's input? And if yes, how do we filter mistakes uh, so that the network doesn't, doesn't repeat the mistakes that humans do? Thank you. Well, so I, think, I think for that one, I mean, I think, again, you know, I think I would say it goes back to the question of, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, deep recurrent neural networks. I mean, uh, some of the implementations that I've seen in industry that have been like really impressive, that are, I can emphasize, really hard to nail, is things with, for example, reinforcement learning, where you can actually get people to continuously provide the input to the to the to the um, to the model, but the the way that you get the feature, the, the way that you define the feature space. The way that you get the input and the way that you define the loss function, it's the hard part. You know, once you're able to have that, then I mean, yeah, anything is possible, right? But, but I don't know what we, we, we would like to add some some to that. I think well. that would be less of. Um, I'm by no means an expert in this particular in that particular mm -hmm. question you asked, but um, off the top of my head, it's less of a question about how you would tr like change the network to handle incorrect inputs, but more about how are you pre-processing the data that you're feeding into the network? So it's not as if you're going to be, uh, if you're a user on a keyboard, on a phone or whatever, or even on like a, a computer, you're not actually going to be immediately feeding that into a network. You're going to be collecting that and storing it somewhere. So it's really more about how do you take that data, how do you filter out what's right and wrong? Is there some pre-processing step? Even things like spell checkers or grammar checkers you could do, where you could just dump um, the, uh, you could just completely ignore um, uh, user inputs which are we deem to be incorrect. Um, and, uh, or, actually, if you check out the next talk um, with Ling, uh, he's actually talking about spell checking. So you can use things like that to transform invalid user input into valid user input and then feed that into the network. So I think it's more about the, the data processing pipeline before. The general con the concept of neural networks is still at the moment that if you're feeding data into it, that data should be correct. У меня еще три минуты, чтобы помучить спикеров. Ну что, кто-нибудь из вас или мне начать? Коллеги, коллеги, коллеги. А, окей, и last uh, one question uh, that I normally ask for any speaker who talk about uh, convolution neural networks and deep learning and all these amazing things. Uh, human brain uh, theoretically consists of around 100 billion neurons with uh, each neuron uh, has around uh, 10,000 inputs we called uh, dendrites. If uh, we compare the size with uh, artificial uh, neural network with a uh, perceptron like a neuron and uh, perceptron's uh, connections as uh, dendrites, uh, typical uh, neural network, artificial neural network that we use in practice, uh, not for simple tasks, but something like uh, music uh, detection, like huge tasks. Uh, what's the size of uh, typical uh, artificial neural networks? Well, I, th I think that really depends, you know, and as, as Donald pointed out, I think it's, it's less of, of the size and the depth. I mean, the, if you have to do it too deep, it's just because you're giving it much and much more uh, uh, amount of, 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 of flexibility for it to learn a specific complex uh, space. But ultimately, the problem of the exploding gradient will still appear. So if you, if you get a, a neural network of a billion neurons, uh, it probably is going to perform way worse than, than, a, than another network of like significantly uh, magnitudes smaller, mainly because it might have a, a, a either require 
tons and tons more data or a, a, a very different sort of input. Uh, in terms of the number of neurons, it is quite common to have you know, around 30, 30 neuron layers. It would also depend whether you have like convolutional networks, whether you have recurrent networks. But uh, it, there are multiple architectures that, that would have different, different amounts. I mean, I'm not sure what um, would be. Yeah, so know. I think it's, so it's a bit of a, doesn't directly answer your question, but I think I agree with Alejandro about the numbers in that um, it's, neural networks are not in the state at the moment where you can just say, even if we had the compute power, that if you just threw, um, if you modeled a neural network after the human brain, it might not really do what you expect or actually be very useful. Um, I think sometimes the comparison with neural networks with the brain, that's kind of how it was inspired. But when you actually look at the techniques that are out there, they're not really that close to the human brain. Like, you know, this, so this LSTM GRU stuff we were talking about, a lot of that stuff doesn't really map that closely. So they really are artificial and they really are geared towards computers. Uh, based on my experience of neural networks, um, it really depends on the problem. So um, I would say for simple classification tasks, there are kind of simpler problems where you have those high level features like area perimeter, where you've already extracted features from the data. You're not just giving it the raw data, very small. You'll probably have like one layer, 10, 20 hidden, hidden nodes, maybe 100, 200. There's some rules of thumb about what you set based on the number of input features. And then if you're doing images, it really depends on, or, or uh, sequences of text, it really depends on the size of the input you're giving it. If you're giving it a 1,000 by 1,000 image, then the, a convolutional neural network, which is good for image processing, is going to have 1,000 by 1,000 by 5 by whatever nodes. So it all depends on the kind of input size that you're giving it as well. So it's like a few dozens of thousands. Yeah, for image, for image processing, I'd say, oh no, image processing, I'd say 10, 20, 30,000, 50,000, maybe 100,000. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks. So please, uh, applause.